Welcome to the Getting the Deal Done podcast series. And today, my very special guest is my good friend, Lisa Forrest with Live Oak Bank. And she's a familiar face and voice because this is our third time this year. And the reason being the SBA keeps changing their guidance on business acquisition and similar loans. Uh, just released their third formal, she tells me, and fourth altogether update to their standing operating procedures in the first week of November, 2023. Welcome, Lisa. Well, thanks for having me. I always enjoy talking to you, but you know, being on your podcast, normally it's just once a year. We do at the beginning of the year, but uh, just with all the confusion going on with, with SBA, um, I'm happy to be back. Yeah, and they're sure they are making things confusing and changing things rapidly and sweeping. And we'll know that we know they're going to do it again with some updates because uh, nothing ever comes out the way it was expected, whether it's with the government or anybody. So, yeah. so let's start off. What the heck is going on with the latest updates? Okay. Do you want me to kind of go do out my bullet points on what I think is interesting? Yep. That would be great. Just dive in. Okay. And even with what I'm going to share, there's still a few um, areas that are a little uh, nebulous. Uh, so, you know, SBA on an annual basis has been doing an update every year and they've, they've been doing that for decades. Um, most years, it's not very exciting or interesting. So there may be another update uh, in the next six months or in 2024 that that kind of clarifies a few of the, the holes that are still outstanding. And I'll, I'll kind of try to talk about those the best I can. Great. So I think the first thing that's really different that I'd like to talk about is this partial change of ownership. It's not seller role, it's partial change of ownership. And that is you know, groundbreaking for the SBA. In conventional structures, this idea of the seller kind of rolling some equity or retaining some equity is, is how conventional lending has been done for you know, eons. In the SBA ecosystem, it's always been 100% buyout. So now the SBA has introduced another structuring opportunity and I, for one, am, am really interested and curious about how this actually plays out. And uh, we're at Live Oak, we're already doing some of these partial buy-ins, partial buyouts already. We've already been starting those. So a couple things to think about. One, and again, it's not seller role. You are literally buying into the seller's entity. So it's a stock purchase. You are partially buying the company. One of the confusing points is then what happens with the personal guarantee for the seller? There was a lot of um, unanswered questions in the last months about is the seller going to have to personally guarantee or not? SBA has finally confirmed that post-close, if the seller owns less than 20%, retains less than 20% ownership, and they aren't considered key, they don't have to personally guarantee. So let me say that again. If the seller on a post-close basis is owning less than 20% and they're not considered key, they do not have to personally guarantee. So one of your, your clients can, uh, either your, one of your seller clients or, or buyer clients, the seller can retain 15% ownership in the resulting stock redemption. And if they are going to be staying on in a transitional role for any length of time, but they're not considered key such that there can be a realistic transition plan, then in that case, they would not have to personally guarantee. Okay. Who decides if they're key or not? You know, it's going to be a combination. Yeah. I mean, the bank ultimately is going to weigh in on that. Whatever lender you're working with will, will ultimately sort of be the, the judge and jury on that. Um, uh, what we're doing at Live Oak, just as a suggestion, we do a lot of home services where we're doing HVAC or plumbing or or maybe in those cases where there's some sort of roofing license required. This is where we really think this new uh, allowance is going to shine through, where the license is a little difficult for this next generation of entrepreneur to acquire. But maybe the seller can stay on in a one or two, 5% ownership role such that their license can still be used. 
along with a really smart, realistic transition plan. In that case, we're not actually saying that the seller's key in that in that aspect. They're not going to be they're going to be um, moving away from their day to day operations, and there's a a realistic transition plan involved. But if they're going to retain some minority portion in that kind of one to five percent range, as an example, such that their license can be used permanently, sounds like a win win. You know, I know you've had a lot of clients in home services, and that licensing is is just super cumbersome and. And I don't think that the, I think the SBA finally realized it's limiting the ability for the next generation of entrepreneur to move into this um, new ownership role. I think it was the, the rules were hamstringing that from happening in, in regard to the licensing. So we're, we're really excited by this opportunity. Okay. What else? Um, so on the equity ownership. So this is, where I've got like six screens open here so I can go over that. Um, there has been a lot of movement in the idea of equity down payment. Before it used to just, hey, you had to put your 10% down and it had to come from the buyer and maybe they're kind of investors. Then last, uh, then the change before, 5% of the equity could come from the seller and 5% from the buyer. But that 5% in the form of a seller note had to be on full principal and interest standby for the life of the loan. That's the, the precedent equity rules that we were working in under. So now there are, it's kind of a two-parter. There is in the first scenario, the seller note can count for up to 100% of the full entire equity if the seller note is on two year full standby. So that's no principal and interest being paid for the first two years. In theory, the SBA is allowing for the equity injection, 10% to be covered 100% by that two year, no p &I full standby seller note. Couple of things happen after that two year period, the note then can't be on a balloon. So there has to be term and amortization after that two-year period. And at least for Live Oak, we're going to be looking at the term and amortization in a couple ways. One, we want certain debt service coverage on the amortization, and then we want to hit a certain debt service coverage hurdle on the term of that seller note. So if it's on full principal and interest for two years, um, and then maybe it amortizes over 10 uh, 10 years kind of due in five. We're, this is one of these clarification points because the SBA has so, said no balloons after that two year period. So does that really mean you can't have a 10 am due five, even if the debt service allows? That is one of those open areas. Uh, the way it reads is that no balloons can be allowed after that two year standby period. So I think this is one area where we're gonna be getting clarification from the SBA over months. And then there's going to be lots of interpretation from various lenders on uh, term and amortization and then what you do or do not count in debt service coverage. At Live Oak, just as an example, we're going to count the resulting payments um, after that two-year period in debt service coverage. And we wanted to hit our certain metrics yeah. um, you know, for our, our various verticals. Well, it seems to me that there will be buyers who aren't going to be putting any skin in the game, so to speak, by making a wire transfer right before closing of their own funds. And on first thought, it would seem the price to the seller might be a little lower than normal because you're financing more. Yeah. Um, so there's, it's going to be really, really interesting to see how this all plays out. And it's going to be a lender to lender thing, but the way it's written I mean, in theory, you could do literally 100% financing yeah. without the buyer coming in with anything. Um, I don't think every lender and probably most lenders aren't going to go down that path, but there will be some. I'm just speaking for Live Oak. We're still going to want the preponderance of the equity down payment to come from the buyer and their sort of buyer team. I mean, we're doing cash flow lending, asset light. These aren't collateral backed. And especially in a lot of cases, we've got first time buyers. And so we um, we want a balanced cap stack. That's at least our our viewpoint on that. At least from where I sit today, um, uh, with this reading. 
I think you should. I, I if I'm representing a seller, I'm I'm going to be saying, wait a minute, that buyer's not putting anything in. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's another theory too, where if the seller is really thinking maybe they're not going to get their seller note paid back at all, so do they really care about it? And so are they pricing it? Are they already pricing in the uh, take home that? that day at close with the idea that maybe all of their seller note isn't going to get paid back if sellers aren't bringing any equity in. And so is that going to lead to some bad behaviors? I don't know. We could speculate all day long on that. We could one. speculate, but I would, I would call, tell a seller client, uh, you, you need the buyer to be putting something in. They have to have a vested interest in, in it besides just, Hey, I'm going to buy a business. And maybe we're just too old school for this. I don't know. But uh, and then there's a part B to how the equity is working. So the first part A was, um, in theory, 100 percent of the down payment can come from the seller note if it's on that two year full standby, no principal and interest. There's a part B to that. If there is a two year standby. With interest only payments being allowed, then 25 percent of the equity down payment has to come from the buyer. 25% of that 10% has to come from the buyer. And then that seller note that's on two years with interest only, 75% of the 10% can come from the seller. And again, um, no balloons. So in theory, the way we're reading this, you then have to have a fully amortizing, full term amortization on the resulting seller note after that two year period. I think there's going to be a lot of fluidity in that as to how lenders are viewing that. And I know that we are going to be looking at including those ultimate seller note payments in debt service coverage. That's at least how Live Oak is going to be doing it. So there's going to be some fluidity as to which lenders include debt service on those seller notes or not. So, um, well, that's Lisa, point. you and I both know that there are banks that are really worried about getting paid back and having a successful client and there are others that just want to make the loans. And there will yeah. be some uh, quote unquote abuses of this system until it rears its ugly head and the SBA changes things again. Yeah. And I think generally the, the runway on, you know, defaults or, or, or the stats showing up, I think the runway is kind of three to four years, three, four and a half years down the road when you've exhausted all of the options, if you're not doing well. So the loan just doesn't go into default overnight. It takes a number of years. So, um, we are, um, and me personally, as a banker, we're just going to be applying kind of our tried and true, structures that have worked for a really long time. Now, there might be some cases, case by case, where some of these reduced equity um, allowances might come in handy if you've got an internal buyer, maybe um, yeah. a key manager buying it internally. That This might make a lot of sense for there. For, for yeah, management, family mm -hmm. thing. And you mentioned old school. Let's just say most sellers are old school because this is a big part of their net worth. And they are not usually the ones wanting to gamble a lot with it. Yeah. Okay. So um, it'll be interesting to see how this all turns out, right? So um, the next the next uh, part that I think is interesting is for um, acquirers that maybe might kind of maybe more mid-career acquirers that have, um, you know, strength in a resume and also strength in their personal financial statement. The SBA used to... Um, say that you could be too strong as a buyer. You could have too much liquidity to um, be afforded the SBA term and structure opportunities. They have changed that. So you um, can have a stronger personal financial statement. And as long as the SBA loan is still the structure that's going to work. I mean, if, if you can't, because again, the SBA has a longer term, it is, um, the SBA is meant to mitigate lack of collateral. So again, the SBA is still here to help a broad base of business acquirers that really can't get this kind of structure elsewhere. And so for a mid-career acquirer that might have a, a pretty good nest egg, they, um, the SBA is now allowing, you know, pretty 
pretty nice amounts of liquidity to remain after uh, injection. And I, I also think that that is really exciting for the sellers out there. If uh, this next generation of entrepreneur might have uh, some more asset li liquidity to their name, I think that just strengthens what we're doing here. So that's an exciting one. Uh, a especially bit of for you, John. Yeah, right. yeah. And especially for you, John, you have such a good network. Um, I think this could be really compelling for you and your clients. Okay. So what else? I guess we could say that for the next hour, but what else is on the top of the list? Yeah. And so another area that I think is interesting is being able to use your HELOC, your home equity line of credit, for your down payment. And the SBA has always allowed that. But there's a caveat here that's changed that I think is going to open up uh, for our next generation of entrepreneurs to use their own cash that is tied up in home equity that they have been paying into and paying on for years now. So the rule change is that, yes, you can still use your HELOC for your down payment. The rule used to be that you had to have outside sources of income to pay for that increased debt. And that outside source of income couldn't be the small business that you were acquiring. It couldn't be your salary from the thing that we were helping you finance. But now the SBA has um, uh, you know, done away with that. So if you're getting a home equity loan, you're tapping the equity that you've been paying into in your home, and that's going to be the source of your down payment. As long as you can show that all the sources of repayment can cover that total debt and that can include now your new salary from the, the small business concern and you have enough um, total sources of income to pay for that HELOC, you can absolutely use that for your down payment. And I think that's um, I think that's really right. I like that. So previously, I mean, the obvious example would be my spouse works, their, their income covers the HELOC payments. Yeah, that used to be where usually the go-to was for that, where it was then your spouse. And then then what that did is that kind of led you down a slippery slope. It's like, oh, wait a second, you need your spouse's support for the, the loan. So now does your spouse have to guarantee? There was just a whole um, other kind of line of questioning that we'd have to go down that, that we felt was a little punitive, maybe a lot punitive, considering you have been paying into this equity all along. And now... Um, you know, it, it maybe it could be spouse's income. It could be it could be largely it's going to be the salary that you're going to now get from the the thing that we're helping you finance, yeah. Um, without making it too cumbersome to find these outside sources of income. So, on the subject of HELOCs, if if a business buyer takes out a HELOC on their house, let's say they have a uh, million dollars of equity in their house, and they take out a HELOC for five hundred thousand then that is putting that, that HELOC is in second position behind their primary mortgage and the bank will be in third position on that per amount, that 500,000. Yeah, and, and are you suggesting that they may not be using that HELOC for their down payment? They're just trying to preserve maybe some yes. working capital. Okay, yeah. So that, that has been a strategy that's been used for decades of, uh, especially there's transition risk, there's transition costs, you're, you're, you're going into this acquisition to grow the company also. So the idea that you're um, preserving home equity from the standpoint of having access to additional working capital for your needs for the business as, as you transition and grow, that's been a strategy that's been, been going on for, for decades. It's going to be a lender to lender thing as to how the lender thinks about, well, are you you know, are you going around the rule uh, for SBA that that the SBA is going to take a lien on your house to provide some amount of collateral support? Um, that'll be a case by case. And with a lot of our clients, sometimes they'll take out some amount of um, home equity um, in second position to preserve that for working capital and then maybe leave some amount of collateral available for the lender in that third position. So um, there'll be di different strategies to use um, depending on the certain case. But in theory, you could uh, yeah. you know, take that second out to be used as working capital for you going forward in your business. Yeah. And I will say my experience is most banks, at least the ones I've worked with, my clients have worked with the bankers I know, would take the more conservative approach of uh, yeah, we don't really like you having that HELOC out there. Uh, and now, but now it's been memorialized that they can do that. And, you know, you talk about sources of repayment, would that then fall into the calculation of debt coverage? 
you know, I don't think we're going to do it that way. I mean, it, is it there? And, um, you know, from the standpoint of debt service coverage, we're just going to look at largely the business operations that you're acquiring and the historic debt service coverage there. But in theory, is it a, a tertiary, tertiary form of repayment? Potentially. But I will tell you, when things don't go well, uh, it gets a little sticky and gets a little messy, you know. So we're not going to really count on that as part of the debt service coverage. Yeah. But, but in theory, I would think, potentially. I would think that uh, you're the, a, a good bank then is also going to make sure that between the salary the buyer is taking, not counting on profits or distributions, and say a spouse's salary, that they're personally going to be able to do that. Oh, from another form of repayment. Yeah. So someone comes in and says, well, yeah, oh, I'm, you know, my lifestyle is based on 150,000 a year, my salary, but I'm willing to take a 120 because I really want this business. But well, are you going to be able to pay your HELOC or are you be able to pay other things? Or are you going to be amassing credit card debt at that salary level? It's always been a calculation you and other bankers have done. Sure. Yeah, we look at what your personal living needs are. We literally look at how much your personal living needs are. And one, um, hopefully, the, I mean, the best case scenario is that the salary you're taking out of the company on a go forward basis is figured into the historic debt service coverage. And you can cover your personal living needs all with the thing that you are acquiring. It gets a little interesting if the answer is no. If your personal living needs are at a level where you really do need your spouse's outside income, then it becomes a question, well, do we need your spouse's uh, PG? So that is going to be on a case by case basis if, if the bank's going to, if your lender is going to require that. So best case scenario is that you're buying a company at the level that supports covering your personal living needs without having to tap in any other guarantors. Yeah. You know, all you're talking about in these calculations and research and analysis, uh, a week or so ago, a business buyer said to me, I met with such and such bank. It felt like it was an interview. And my response was good. They're trying to get to see the whole picture, not just rush into a loan. Yeah, it is an interview. I mean, you're interviewing us as a potential lender 100%, but it works both ways too. We're interviewing you. Is this a fit? Are you thinking about risk the same way that we are? Um, there are there are so many SBA lenders out there that you want a good fit. You want a lender that looks at the risk the same way you do. And um, we want, at least for our case, uh, we, we do take a, a little bit more conservative view of it. And for the for the clients that are looking at risk the same way we we do, it's a really, really good fit. Uh, but yeah, there's a two-way interview process here, 100%. Yeah. You know, all this is why I, you know, I tell business owners, just when you think the buyer has asked every possible question, the bank and not bank or investor will ask more. And that's what, and that's what you want. It's another set of due diligence eyes for the buyer. Yeah. And, and I would say that in the times that we're in right now, uh, I think that diligence has just been taking a lot longer than it historically has. I don't know if no you found that, but and and I think sellers are, you know, diligencing the buyers a lot more too. Especially, um, I think we're seeing larger seller notes um, required now to get deals done, given where interest rates are. So I think buyers are are asking for bigger seller notes with you know, maybe a forgivable metric. So the buyers spending more time in diligence, but I think the sellers are also to find the, the buyer that's going to be a right fit for them, depending on how the deal's being structured. I don't know if you're seeing that, but we oh, are. I've, but I've always seen that the, the buyer and seller, you know, my line is nobody will buy a business from or sell one to somebody they don't like. And I got that from a client 20 years ago who had sold, we sold a business to a competitor. He bought two more and then he gave me that line and it makes so much sense. 95% of them, they want to see their name up on the door or the building 10 years from now. That company name to show their grandkids and all that. Yeah, and that seller-buyer seller relationship, that's always just been a stalwart of how the best deals get done, best um, acquisition transi transitions get done when that buyer-seller relationship really is, is a good one.
Yeah. So is there anything else on the SBA guidance or do we move into deal structures? Yeah, let's move into deal structures. I think these four, the partial buy-in, the changes in equity, kind of no max personal financial statement and using the HELOC in a, in a um, easier way. I think those four would be good takeaways for everybody. There's some nuances around flood insurance and all this kind of stuff that I don't yeah. think we can talk about. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's talk deal structures. Cause you know, you weren't at my event recently with no. Greg Russell and others. And yet the, on the panel, it was pretty universal. We're seeing more, more variety of structures a lot more talk and actually putting in earnouts or clawbacks and more seller financing that the uh, the buyer can leverage their interest rate instead of paying the bank an SBA loan, what now, 11, 11 and a half. Uh, maybe they get a seller note for six, seven, eight. And yeah. the price doesn't change because of interest payments. Yeah, I like that. Um, and I'm sorry I missed your event. I never do, but I was, you know, traveling, uh, traveling for um one of our conferences we're at. And I I echo that. Um, that resonates really strongly uh for what what I'm seeing and our 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 client interactions, especially on the seller notes. Uh if we're still talking SBA, you you can't have an earnout in SBA. You, you obviously can have that in a conventional context, but we're seeing the use of a lot more forgivable seller notes where you've got clawback metrics tied to the last TTM or 2020 performance, just to make sure that the last year's um, uptick in, in performance is sustainable. And so we're seeing a lot of forgivable seller notes. Um, we're seeing a lot of transactions where 2023 TTM 2020 might be the only year that there's debt service coverage as well because of um, impacts to sort of COVID catch up and uh, some of the other things going on um, in the market where the last full year might be the only year where there is adequate debt service coverage. So there's pretty significant forg forgivable seller notes to actually make the, the project workable. Okay. And we know that they're allowed. Uh, yes. You're seeing, you're seeing more of them. Uh, if you go back a few years, have you seen many of those notes being forgiven or is it too soon? Yeah, I think so. Interestingly enough, I think we've always, John, you know, you know, you and I have always talked about these forgivable seller notes to maybe kind of um, solve for a little bit of valuation gap. So I think we've used them in sort of smaller doses over the years. But I think what's happened in the last year, two years with 2022 and 2023, the, the valuation gap because of real big upticks in performance, I think the forgivable seller note is really now starting to be used where before it was just sort of talked about. So I think we're too soon to see what's going to happen to those. I think that um, 20, certainly 2024, you're going to, in, into 2024, you're going to know if 2023 was sustainable. Uh, 24, 25, I think that's where we're going to bear this out to see if it was a good structure. Yeah. And, and, I think it can be used for other reasons. I mean, when the SBA came out with that about seven or eight years ago, one of our buyer clients was one of the first ones to do it. And it was a customer concentration issue. And there was a price and I'll just make up some numbers. Okay. The business is worth $5 million, uh, but there's a big annual contract with the number one customer. And if they renew it and it, it happened two months before closing. So if it renews with, the next round, the price stays at five million. If it does, if they don't renew, the price would have been just making this up four million. And of course, it renewed, and you know everyone was lived happily ever after. And I love that you mentioned too. It's not just tied to EBITDA or revenue. Absolutely, customer concentrations is a great way to do that. Um, just as an example, uh, had a client call me. There was a. 15% customer concentration. I mean, it wouldn't have made or break, broken our client's ability to pay us back. But if they had lost a 15% customer, that would have put them back on their, their whole reason for buying the company and their growth um, growth plans. Yeah. Um, sure enough, the 15% customer did not renew. And that the way he set it up, the seller note just got clawed back 100% to a place where he was sort of same, same. Yeah. So he, he wasn't a uh, behind the eight ball at all. And it just adjusted the price to a same, same level. So customer mm -hmm. concentration is a great way to, to use that forgivable note. 
obviously that seller knew that the customer was in risk land. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, I'm sure that's exactly what was happening. And uh, they had a great relationship. It wasn't you didn't share enough information with me. They had a really um, upfront conversation about it. And it was a structure that that worked really well. And the buyer and seller are still getting along really well. Yep. That's like the one I just mentioned that that, that particular buyer paid off his 10-year SBA note in less than five. Yeah, that's it great. It I worked. Love those success stories. Okay. I, I so anything else on market conditions and what you're seeing, or should we go into different types of loans that Live Oak Bank offers? I was just going to say, you know, the thing that in SBA, I mean, there's meant to be, you know, highly leveraged transactions. That's how they're designed. But, you know, the idea of bringing in more equity is also a way to, um, you know, adjust for some of these valuations that really haven't started to come down yet, even though interest rates have doubled in the last, you know, two uh, year here. So more equity is also a way to uh, bridge gap on valuation, too. So it's always, yeah. you know. It's maybe we've been just talked about how to get away with less than 10% down. But in a lot of my transactions, our clients are actually bringing in more than 10%, 15, 20% to make um, a deal work that they have a good thesis around. So and we know there's that. a sub industry of people who go out and help find some of that equity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's sort of in, in this context of kind of self-funded searcher coming out where, um, and a lot of even our mid-career um, acquirers too, if they have so much dollars of their own, they're finding larger transactions, bigger EBITDA companies, and um, bringing in minority investors is a good way to, to stretch the equity you have to get into, in theory, maybe a bigger, kind of better deal in theory. So yeah, um, there's banks out there like, like Live Oak, and there's a, a few of us out there that will bring a secondary conventional loan behind the SBA maximum, $5 million. So in theory, we're getting sort of 8, 9, 10, 11, $12 million enterprise value deals done by bringing Live Oak Junior debt in behind the SBA. And there's there's some lenders out there that are, that are doing that. Yeah. Well, let's go back to that equity piece, though, because okay. I, I've seen a, a, a few of those recently. And, you know, obviously that happens in the private equity world that there's, you know, the, you have more equity and all of that. But to a to an individual buyer, perhaps giving up 15% or 19%, it gets you, it should also get you maybe someone on the board who can add value or can, you know, help with uh, maybe some of the functions of the business you don't want to do, but they, you know, we, you and I'm, you know, who I'm talking about, you did his first loan and he's on his fifth or sixth business. And he has set up a back office when he, when he has a company, whether it's a hundred percent or, 19% or anywhere in between, his back office handles all those functions owners hate to do. <laughs> and they do them right. Yeah, absolutely. And that, can, that can be a real value that can exceed the, say, 19% you're giving up. Yeah. And um, in the self-funded search space, it, the ability to partner with equity investors has really professionalized and it's really yeah. modernized the use of the SBA loan program where the operator, and don't get me wrong, these are owner operators. They're going to guarantee they're going to be the owner operator. They bring in some minority investors to help with a uh, bridge equity gap, uh, maybe get into a larger transaction. And to your point, maybe bring some industry skill set as well, because we're still doing a lot of industry agnostic stuff, but you can get someone on your board or in your investor cap table that has some of that industry experience. And our acquirers are still coming away owning 60, 70, 80% of the company, even with bringing some minority investors in. So it is, um, you know, a, a new way of using SBA, I think in a really smart way. Okay. Any final thoughts? I would say that you know, we're in the time of year. Normally I'm doing this with you in January or February. It's interesting doing it in November and December because I think a lot of the, the deals that are getting done, we're, we're working on getting them closed between year end, uh, between now and year end. And all of the financial statements are are coming sort of to a close for 2023. And um, I, again, one of the 
the points that I'm just going to be really curious to see is, is how the valuations start looking in beginning of 2024 when all the kind of the new slate of, of opportunities come, come on the market. In the meantime, next two months, we're, we're really busy closing deals, as all lenders are. But as you're finding new opportunities, it's, it's kind of a twofold. We're closing opportunities for 2023, but then we also start then looking at new projects where we start getting commitment letters going. So a lot of work is being done in November and December. So um, uh, just it's always a, a, just sort of a, a double whammy time of year. The one question regarding that is we overlap the calendar year. What would you say is the cutoff date when to get the loan closed and the deal closed, you need to see the tax return for this year? Oh, if we're closing in 2024 and um, uh, needing yeah. the 2023 tax return? Yeah, let's like say you uh, we've got a deal in the works, sir. It's set to close for December, January fifteenth mm. of next year. No one's at. No one is saying we need tax returns for twenty twenty three because it's too soon. But so, what's yeah. that cutoff date when you would say we now have to see the tax return? Oh, you know, you know, a big part of that is is tell me about the performance of the company. If if, if the if the debt service is is based solely only on twenty twenty three then we're, we're, we're likely going to need to see that tax return for 2023. If there's been really steady performance and 2023 financials, you know, through, you know, October, November uh, are supporting what we've been seeing all along, we might not require a 2023 tax return. Um, a lot of, at least um, with the kind of clients I have, they're also getting quality of earnings reports. So they're getting, they're paying for reports that are confirming the performance. Um, and we might close something in 2024 based on 2023. And we get a quality of earning report through November or October. So we, we might not actually require a tax return in 2023 uh, if we're getting quality of earnings reports also. So it's it's going to be very, very situational dependent. Yeah, it but at some point be, it's, it's going to be too late and you're going to say, okay, it's March. We need to see the tax. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, if if we're if we're trying to close in March, we're going to need that tax return. Yeah. Okay. Lisa, how do people reach you? Uh, easy. Just reach out to me by email. That's always easy. You can find my LinkedIn as well, but it's Lisa Forest with two R's at liveoak.bank. and you can also send me a text four two five nine 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 two zero four two. For those of you just kind of getting started on your entrepreneurial acquisition journey, I also have a weekly office hours every Wednesday. I go over everything SBA with my colleague, Sarah Andrews. We do that every Wednesday and we walk you through a sample structure and you get benefit of everyone's Q&A on our weekly Zoom calls. So email me for the links to register and we'd be happy to have you. Are you still doing the cash flow one also? Yes. And then I do the cash flow one on Thursday. We okay. have templates to help you do cash flow, executive summaries. We have a qualitative template. We have that on our Thursday session every week. And I'll have those, your contact info and uh, that in the uh, write-up uh, of the podcast. So All right. people can get a hold of that. And, and by the way, I, I, you know, Lisa's a good friend, but what they offer on that Wednesday and Thursday is fantastic. I tell every buyer I meet, it seems you, you need to check out this to get an overview of lending and what a bank wants to see on your cash flow presentation. Because whether it's your bank or another, another bank, they all want to see the same kind of thing when it comes to cash flow and debt coverage. Absolutely. Well, I okay. appreciate that. Thank you so much, Lisa. All right. You got it. Thanks, John. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.